May all beings be happy. May all beings be healthy. May all beings be free from harm. May all beings love life. May all beings awaken. Welcome to another Gook Audio podcast. I'm DC Puba of Gook Audio and Gook Archives, preserving the legacy of Shunju Suzuki and those whose paths crossed his and anything else that comes to mind. I pray that you and yours are safe and comfortable, free from economic hardship, and able to get out and do whatever it is you want within the limitations of the universal precept of do as little harm as possible. So uh, today we're going to have part two of the conversation with uh, Jeannie De Prima. Um, And uh, this took place a, a few months later. Um, <laughs> after the part one, three months later. And um, just to remind you, Jeannie uh, is the daughter of the poet Diane de Prima, who died not long ago. And uh, Jeannie was a Zen student when she was, you know, like 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And... Um, you know, she was at Tassahara, not at a practice period, but in the family, you know, with uh, her mother. But then, then sometimes her mother would leave and she'd be there without her. Um, and um, so this is the second uh, conversation with her. But uh, the um, Tassahara stories that's called Monk and De Prima, in other words, there's two pieces, has... has uh, Really some good stuff about Jeannie uh, in it and Diane, and it's really good background for these uh, conversations. Hmm. Okay, so we'll get right into it. We'll give her a call uh, just as soon as we've had our pause to meditate. So when you hear the bell, if you're of such a mind, hit pause and meditate or whatever for as long as you wish. And when you're ready to join us, Hit unpause, and we'll hit the bell to end the meditation, and we'll give Jeannie a call. Hey, Jeannie, David, Chad. Um, hi, David. How are you? I was just sending you a note. In fact, I just two seconds ago sent you a note. Oh. Um, I listened. To, I, I'm good. I listened to the um, the piece you sent. You sent me a link on the other piece that you posted about Diane. Yeah. And I listened to it, and I I sent you a little note in Messenger. There's a couple of little things in there that are. Are a little off, but I don't think it's a big deal. I mean, probably nobody's going to care but you and me. Okay, wait a minute, um, wait a minute. No, no, I care what you say. Just a second. I, I listened to the part about Diane. You got a couple of dates wrong, but it's not a big deal. Also, Leroy and Diane were never married. They had a long-running affair uh, while Leroy was married to Hetty Jones. They had two daughters, and Alan and Diane were married by Roshi. In 64, not 62. I said 62? Huh. Yeah, you did. Important because in 62, neither Alex or Dominic, my brother and sister, were, not weren't, born yet. (laughs) Dominic (laughs) is Leroy's (laughs) child. Alex is Alan's. Yeah, Dominic. Oh, yeah, we always called her Minnie. Yeah, she hates that. She can't. She, that's oh, yeah, like, it's a kid's that's name. Like, yeah. Right, exactly. Exactly. Uh, I, I remember her. Uh, oh, well, I remember her in many places, but she was working at Greens when I was there. So uh, she was working yeah, at the bakery yeah. counter, I remember. 
Yeah. Uh, and what is she right now? She's got like a TV show or something. She's doing. Uh, she's doing. Talk, she just got picked up by um, Tavis Smiley. Just started a new black talk radio station. The the first one west of the Mississippi, as they describe it, in LA. Yeah. So it's a it's an a it's on an AM AM uh, channel, and she's anchoring the uh, morning drive talk show, you know, the 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh-huh. talk time, you know, when people are commuting to work. Yeah. So it's it's a really, it's the it's like the, the key anchor spot on the, on this big new talk radio platform. So she's doing, she's doing good stuff. Yeah. It's called, um, un, her show is called Unpro- Unapologetically Progressive. It's <laughs> <laughs> pretty cool. Yeah, she looks really yeah, good. She, yeah, yeah, she looks. She's great. She's in great shape. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. Alex doing? Is he? He's a musician. He's a keyboard player. Yeah, he's doing great. He's uh, he's got you know some good successes under his belt. He's got a, a platinum album and um, some won a bunch of Emmys and. All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You you've got yeah. to you got to give us a name so we can look it up. A platinum album. We got to know the name of it. Oh 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 oh! It's um, D'Angelo's. There's a guy named a musician named D'Angelo, and Alex produced the song Brown Sugar on D'Angelo's album of the same name, and it went platinum. Wow! Cool. Uh, Alex yeah. Marlowe, Alex Marlowe. Alex Marlowe, M-A-R-L-O-W-E. Right. And he has, uh, so he's living down in um, Australia. He married an, an Australian lady. Oh. And, uh, or no, I'm sorry, she's a, she actually was a, I'm sorry, that's wrong. She was a South African lady with Australian relatives. Anyway, they uh, they moved down to be closer to her family in Australia, and they have a daughter. They just had a little girl a few years ago. Yeah. Like five years ago. She's young. She's a really young child for Alex's age. Um, and he, he seems to be in good shape. Oh, that's good. Hey, the connection, you're, you're a little garbled. I wonder what that is. I'm wondering if I changed my, um, if I put on my professional earbuds. Well, have, try that. Try better, that. Uh, try that. Yeah. Okay. Are you there? Oh yeah, that's gone now. Now it's clear. Okay. Good. Okay, I got some comments. Uh, I mean, I just went over. Uh, we had about an hour and a half talk, and I just we went did? over it. We talked for that. Yeah. Did we talked for that long. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And wow. Um, you know, that was three months ago. I've been very busy. I, I meant to call you back sooner. But I just finished an audio book for Crooked Cucumber, and I just had a book come out. Zen is right now. It's a sequel to Zen is right here. Good for uh, you, baby. I just came out this Proud month. Proud of you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, I'm working on some other stuff. Oh, right I'm working on. on a record album, too. Your whole life. You've been playing music ever since I've known you. Yeah. Yeah, I you. I used to, I played yes, you, you so many songs. <laughs> uh, I was, and uh, anyway, uh, I've just been busy. I especially appreciated how you, you forgave your mother completely. I mean, your mother went on strike as a mother at one point. Uh, <laughs> completely. Well, completely. I used to spend, I used to spend every Sunday, I used to spend every Sunday down the street on Haight Street, there was a big laundromat at Haight and Buchanan. And she used to take me down there yeah. with the laundry for everybody in our house. And that was, you know, four kids, my mother and her entourage. Of, there was always three or four extra people at least. And I would have to do everybody's laundry and have it sorted and folded before I could be picked up. And it took me all day, every Sunday. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so that was part of being Diane's kid when you were like 11. <laughs> but, 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 you know, you know, then you turned out, you know, like you said that Diane 
she couldn't she couldn't do what Alan did in terms of some of the things from the past, especially the Millbrook experience. Right. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you forgave her for her completely. I mean, and that's that's really the way to be. That's really the way to be. I mean, that's very impressive to me. Before I talked to her, before I went to her and asked for that conversation that I asked for with Alan, you know, can I please ask yeah. you what the what were you thinking when you did X? When I asked her to have that conversation with me, um, I invited her to lunch. You know, we went to a nice restaurant. And when before yeah. I sat down with her, though, my internal process had been my, the work I had done had gone on for years, years. And I had gotten myself to the point where I was completely detached from her answer. Like whatever her answer was, was going to be OK. If she said, I'm sorry, that would be great. If she said, I don't know what the fuck you're talking about. I have no idea what you mean. I would have to be okay with that. So I became okay without That's pretty good. whatever whatever it was going to be. And so when she said, you know, I did, I made the best decision I could at the time. And that was yeah. all she said. That was all she said. Yeah. That was it. That I was, was like, yeah. you know, okay, that's it. That's all she can do. That's all she can do. She's still my mother and I still love her and I'm over yeah. it. I'm done with it. I put it away. Yeah. So thank you for recognizing that, seeing that. It, oh, yeah. It makes me oh, feel yeah. really, it's really moving to me that it actually shows that, <laughs> that I've done well, some work. That means a lot. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. Uh, um, one thing about Diane is she did provide support for everybody including alan uh yeah. uh enormous amount uh do you know where that was coming from well um diane when we were living at 436 page diane um was doing something called poetry in the schools she was reading she was doing poetry readings in um through the national endowment for the arts they had a poetry in the schools program and she was she would travel out to like Indian reservations and teach the uh -huh. kids in the, in the schools poetry. And they would make her travel all around the country teaching poetry. And so she brought money in that way. She also wrote, you know, like she wrote memoirs of a beatnik, which is, you know, 50% pornography. She wrote that for evergreen press in 1968 when we were living at 1915 Oak street. And she kept sending the book into them finished and they kept sending it back to her telling her to put more sex in it and i remember the adults she gathered the adults around the table a couple of times to help her beef up the she got i guess she used up all her own ideas and she needed some extra help <laughs> so she grown up sat around and helped her come up with some new ideas for additional sex for memoirs of a beatnik the point is she got uh, three thousand she got three thousand dollars for memoirs of a beatnik um three thousand dollar advance which was a lot of money back then and, you yeah. know, so she did things like that, but we never, yeah. we were never flush. We were never rolling in dough. She occasionally would get gifts from the guys in the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. Do you remember them? Yeah. They well, well, I around. certainly remember them. Ed and Carl, were yeah. that their names? Yeah. Ed and Oh, Walt. I remember them very well. They hung out yeah. at the house a great deal. Yeah. 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 So they, they often gave her money. And bought yeah. food, you know, they, they gave a lot of material support. In fact, yeah. Walt helped me rent my apartment. Walt was the one who put the deposit on my apartment for me when I got my first apartment. You know, the one at 364 Walt. Page. Was, was it um, Ed, Ed and Ed Walt? And, yeah, it was Ed and Walt. Ed and Walt. Yeah. Uh, Walter Schneider and Ed May. You and I visited, the, mm. the tallest one was Ed, right? Mm-hmm. Other way, um, Ed was the tall one with the blonde hair, and Walt was a tall one, not quite as tall, but also a tall one with dark hair. Uh, Walter was a pilot. Oh, maybe I'm thinking of Walt. I'm th we, you and I went and visited Walt at an, uh, his apartment in uh, over in Pacific Heights or over there somewhere. Yeah, once. yeah, that was Walt. And, that was Walt. And, yeah. And so we visited him there, and. He had uh, just been arrested and <laughs> let out and were released. And oh, wow. he had, the police had broken in. They had a search warrant. And he had a big bowl 
of what looked like pot or something. It didn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could tell it wasn't pot, but it was an herbal smoking hash. mix. It was probably hash. hash no, hash. no, it was not. Nope. It was an oh. herbal smoking mix or something yeah. like that. <laughs> and that's what they took. They got oh. that. All right, we've got you. And they they took him to jail and then tested. And then he was let go because it wasn't that. And then he oh, took funny. you and me. He took you and me back to his bedroom and opened up a suitcase that was full of hash uh, discs. Uh, those patties. And they hadn't cream. even gone back yeah. to the bedroom to live. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that used to happen to those guys all the time. They were constantly getting off by some crook or crook of technicalities, man. We could talk about them for another two hours, David. Oh, yeah, they were yeah. they were quite the you know, there aren't very many people left in the world who remember that culture or those yeah. men <laughs> or 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 recognize what an important role they played in the enlightening of gen of a generation of people because they Walter Schneider was a pilot. He was a lieutenant former lieutenant commander in the Navy. And we had met him originally at Millbrook. OK, I remember uh, him at Millbrook and he used to fly planefuls of Afghani Primo from Afghanistan. He used to fly the planefuls of hash back over here. He was a real uh, hero and, and and, you know, responsible for bringing a lot of really good stuff, <laughs> you know, stuff that kept people high as opposed to. See, the thing is, the guys in the Brotherhood of Eternal Love. They smuggled, but they never smuggled anything but hash and pot. They would use cocaine and they would use other things when they were on their own, but they never uh -huh. smuggled coke and they never smuggled heroin. And they didn't, you know, or any of the other drugs. It was like they, they drew a well, line. That's interesting in the to sand. know. Because yeah, they drew there a was very definitely clean. cocaine at yeah, there was, house. There, was, there was a lot of cocaine around their scene, but they never smuggled it. They did not smuggle yeah. it. It was a line that they drew in the sand. Yeah, there wasn't. A, they, they they weren't like heavy coke addicts, though. I mean, they didn't have that type of vibe. He was more into no. the 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 psychedelics, the entheogens, the the. They loved the mushrooms. The, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. mushrooms. Psilocybin. Yep. And and they thought they were in in uh, enlightening America. Do you do you know that the FBI arrested eighty of them in one day? Uh, oh really? I did not know that. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. And and didn't Walter end up going to prison? Oh, uh, I honestly, David, I do not know. I do not. I I don't know what the end of that story is. That's what that's what Vince's story was. He was he was a fugitive when I met him. He was already a they, there was a guy in uh, down in Laguna Canyon. One of the anyway, one of the detectives that was after that whole Ooh. group of guys. Had the hot spring for Vince. The guy, Vince, the guy I married was one oh, of the brotherhood. Oh, he was one of, right. yeah, he was one of the brotherhood guys. And oh, so, really? He was brotherhood oh, yeah. guy. Went bad. Oh, yeah. Too bad. Yeah. Yeah. Well, oh. you know, I have another, I got another story I haven't, I got to tell you. <laughs> All right, go on. You want to make me tell this? I just got to tell, this is a really off the wall snippet, but it's a funny, yeah. it's kind of funny, it's kind of sad. Take a wild guess where the place was that I first, that I did my first shot of heroin. Where do you think oh, that might have happened? I don't, I don't know. know. Take a wild guess. Take it your first shot of heroin. Okay, was... wait, wait, let's return, reverse it. Think of where it didn't happen. Think of where it couldn't have happened, where you can't imagine Zen it Center. <laughs> Zen Center. <laughs> Page Bingo. Street. Bingo. No, it didn't happen at Page Street. It happened at Green Gulch. And you know how it happened? I was at Green Gulch with the kids after that horrible scene with Vince that I described to you earlier. I was at Green Gulch minding my own business, taking care of my little kids. I was a guest. I had a room in the guest house, and the, you know, right? And on Saturday rolls around, or whatever day, I think it was Saturday, maybe it was Sunday. When do they have them at? Anyway, whatever day they have lecture. And everybody comes out for lecture. And who comes over to me at... for at Let me Keith guess Hines? who came. Renee. Who was yes, exactly. Exactly. Bingo. 
so he says to me, uh, you know, what are you doing to Prima? How are you? Blah, blah, blah. What do you, do you want to get high? And I'm like, I'm sitting out here watching my kids. I've been doing cocaine pretty much every day for, except for when I was pregnant. But I've been doing cocaine for a couple of months anyway. And uh, hadn't, so I hadn't had anything to, I hadn't gotten high since I'd left, of course, since I'd left the house. And uh, I said, sure, I'll, sure. And he said, all right, I'll be back later. And uh, so he came back and um, he came up to the room and he sat down at the little table and he pulled out a needle and a spoon. And I said, oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I can't do that. I've never done that. And I'm certainly not going to do it with that thing. I was all, you know, I was being very haughty. And he just, he just kind of looked at me and kind of shrugged and said, well, if you want to, if you want to get high, this is the way you're going to do it. And I think you're going to want to. And he just prepared it and he just went for it. And he put that thing around my arm and I didn't stop him. And I'll tell you something, David, yep. he didn't do me a favor. He didn't do me a favor. It was the best feeling I'd ever had in my life. <laughs> and I did not, and I did not forget it. And I spent the next, um, well, anyway, I spent some time trying to, I spent some time trying to find my way back there over the next, it took me many, many years to actually pick up the heroin habit, but I eventually did. It took me all the way until uh -huh. 1985 and I only had it for a year. But um, anyway, that's another story for another day. You don't want to hear about wow. my drug use. Um, but anyway, wow. that, that was then and this is now and, and the story had a happy ending. So um yeah. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Interesting karmic karmic connection there, huh? Yeah. Something yeah. something interesting about that. There's something interesting yeah. about that. I'm not sure what, but Yeah. Anyway, well, yeah. Uh most interesting, right? Well, that was I'm so glad. I'm so I'm so glad you were able to plug in his name though. That makes me feel not quite so alone in it. <laughs> yeah, oh, I could tell you a lot about Renee. Uh, and you could tell me a lot too, because I know you saw him some through the years. I saw uh, him a couple times, not that a little bit. In 1987, I saw him a few times around 86 and 87. In fact, I saw him one day when I was hitting my bottom, and I said I said something to him about how he had. I said something like, "You stopped using drugs. How the hell do you do it?" And he looked at me and said, "It's very simple. You just don't take them anymore." <laughs> yeah. You know, it was like like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 right. was, he was a, right. he was a trip has he passed do you know oh yeah he died oh i don't know 10 years ago okay died of lung mm. cancer which really pissed him off because he hadn't smoked in decades but um, uh yeah i could talk a lot about renee uh but no oh we were one thing is it, just yeah. the name of the school. Uh, when you said the name of the school on page three, that's John Muir. John Muir. Yeah, John Muir School. Okay. You know John Muir, right? Yeah, yeah, the, the conservationist. The, right, right. Yeah. And I said John Wallman, which is oh, a... Oh, which is the school. You know, that's so funny. That's the school that Dominique and Alex went to in Grass Valley. That's why I... That's. Oh, yeah, so did my son, Clay. Oh, you're I kidding. mean, my son, that's uh, Dominique Kelly. Dominique and Alex went. My, Kelly went there. Oh, wow. Wow. That is, what years did they go? Um, well, let's see. They, they're older. They're older they're than older Kelly. Because they graduated when I was still with Vince, and Vince and I went to pick them up when Dominique graduated. My mother didn't even send anybody to go pick up her kids. Vince and I happened to be going up there to commemorate their graduation, and we turned out to be the only people there, so we brought them <laughs> home to our house, both of the kids with us. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Dominique moved yeah. in with us for a while. So that would have been 1978 yeah. or 9, 1979. Yeah. Yeah, and Kelly would have been uh, six years old. Yeah, so it was a few <laughs> years later. <laughs> uh, or actually, he would have been five years old because he was born in the fall. Uh, hmm. What year was he born? Yeah, what, all right. What year, was, it, what year was he born? 73. He was, Kelly was born in 73 at Green Gulch. Oh, wow. Uh, Wow. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. How did that go? And 
Great. Yeah. Natural childbirth. Awesome. It was great. Dia, Di, Diane is Dia. Yeah. She's been Dia yeah. I, re- I remember. Yeah. Oh, yeah. She was great. I, and like, as soon as she started getting contractions, I became her slave. And our, <laughs> our, I mean, really, yeah. it's like she was just commanding me. I could not, for nine hours, get up to take a peek. Yeah, I I remember. Wh- maybe, no, maybe I could when the midwives <laughs> right, finally arrived. Right, right. I mean, and I had to call. I had to call. But that's the way I experienced it. She she was having me put pressure on her back and different things. But it went very well. I think it, it was a nine hour, uh, uh, nine hours. And the midwives were there when she had the baby. And uh, Dr. Uh, Kaczynski came by afterwards. Um, it sounds like a re- was- it sounds like a complete repeat of what happened with uh, I mean kind of sort of you know uh, Dr. Kozinski wait a minute is that the same doctor it was it was Wit Wit yeah Sokolowski and Kozinski at, at the Point Reyes uh, yeah they're the uh, same doctors clinic, that were at my house called. that came to my house after my two kids I had both of my kids at home with natural childbirth. Um, my son was born on the Inverness Ridge, so Mike Whitty came. At, I had the midwives there when I was in labor, and then he came after, you know, right at the very end. And uh, yeah, cause that's he, what they did. Yeah, it was. It's amazing. It's amazing. Yeah, but, and in Japan, Clay was born in '91 from uh, Elon mm-hmm. uh, at a midwife. At a birthing center. It was a center just for having babies. Oh, then how it was neat. run and owned by a doctor, but all the all the deliveries were done by the midwives with the doctor watching and just making sure everything's all right. Yeah, yeah. And that was great. We had our own room there. Lovely. And um, and we stayed for three days afterwards. Oh, how lovely! And they had classes. It, all the class, everything was in Japanese. Of course. But uh, it was cool. Yeah. It was cool. It sounds and great. And the head midwife, oh, she was so great. She said, it's very important. Like when we got hold of her when, when Elon was pregnant. And she said, it's very important to have sex throughout the pregnancy. <laughs> Boy, was that the greatest gift. <laughs> and, you know, of she course. was lovers with the doctor, you know, who lived with his wife and family there. Very common type thing. Sure. Japan. Uh, anyway, it was just wonderful. Uh, so, um, oh yeah, you said Trungpa and then we're drinking sake. I mean, we're drinking vodka. I bet they were yeah. drinking sake. I mean, I did know. you know they were I, drinking vodka? No, I know they were drinking vodka. Cause oh, I had you do? Them. Oh, horrors. I, d- I tasted it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, and when he proposed and said he wanted to marry you, you said you didn't know if he was joking or not. I said, well, he was joking. Well, no, but he was telling you that he found you very attractive and desirable. I mean, Trungpa was after every woman he came of course. in contact with. <laughs> uh, and, um, you know, he didn't, there were no restrictions uh, in his mind. But... Uh, he was just letting you know that to him. Oh, I'm sure if you I had desirable. acquiesced, there, yeah, I'm sure I would have been a place would have been found for me if I had acquiesced. <laughs> yes, right, right. That's right. They would have made you the official concubine or something. Or something. Everybody, <laughs> his wife was uh, Lady Diana, and her mother was called the I Queen remember Mother. Her. I, re- I remember her well. She was a beautiful yeah. blonde lady. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. She wrote a cool book about him. Oh. Did, you know what I remember what's it about? Called? Huh? What's it called? You know what it's called? The, her book? Yeah, I mean, I can get it for you in a second. That, my favorite yeah. thing in the book is, um, you know, they, she was like 16, and they just met and just got married. And, you know, they slept together once, and they got married. And then he calls yeah. he calls a friend to say, hey, guess what happened? Uh, I just got married. Uh, and he said, just a second, I don't know, I'll ask her. Um, excuse me, honey, what's your name? Oh, my God. <laughs> Isn't that something? Uh, That's something, yeah. Uh, yeah. Diana Trunk, uh, 
So you know, it's really it's really interesting to me. Dragon Thunder, my life with Chogyam Trungpa. Dragon Thunder. Let me. Thank you. Dragon uh, Thunder. I'm gonna make a yeah, note of that. It's good. I mean, she doesn't know it back. Uh, yeah. Diana Dragon J. Thunder. Mukpo. Diana J. Mukpo, author. Carolyn Rose Gimian, author. Uh, Carolyn Gimian runs the uh, CTR archives, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche archives, and, and has for many years. Thank you for that. Uh, I will look that book up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, your very touching story about uh, you and Alan uh, resolving uh, this uh, uh, issue in the past with Millbrook. Yeah. And you said there were other things you had to resolve. That was just one of them. What were you talking about? Well, it's interesting that you bring up Millbrook. You know, I just got back from Millbrook, by the way. I went to Millbrook for a reunion. Oh, my of the God. Kids, of other, me and, and the other people who were also nine and ten years old when I was there got together this last month at Millbrook. We got access to the property. Um, in fact, I saw Willie Hitchcock and Johnny Moore and Eric Mann, Glenn McCready, Cliff McCready. These are all people who were at Millbrook with me when I was a child. And it was really an amazing and profound experience. It was Oh, my God. Incredible. Let's hear about it. Let's hear about it. Well, you know, what can I say? I mean, it, it was the place is as beautiful as I remember it. But it really brought the experiences that we had. It gave it gave me an it gave me the perspective not just of of age, but of well, maybe awareness, um, practice. You know, I don't know the, whatever I brought to the experience this time. It really allowed me to see the place as the magical sort of, as having the sort of magical, um, it has a kind of power to it. The place itself has a real magical power to it. And that was very apparent when we went back. But it also brought it down to size for me because I'm an adult now. And I was mm -hmm. able to see the places like the room that I had that my, my worst, um, experience on acid in I was able to sit in that room with two of two of my friends who were also there with me that night when I came on to that trip and we were able to sort of bring it you know bring the the thread through the eye of the needle if you will yeah yeah and and I just feel like I really um I came to some some peace with it uh, the place is stunningly beautiful. I can send you some pictures um, uh, for you to see. Sure, it's it's sure. just gorgeous. And it was built, you know, it was built by a German um, back in, you know, when they brought over, he brought over all these workmen and, and, the, and a lot of the materials. And he designed this place after a place in Germany. And it has all, it has that feel to it. It has the feel of an old European you know, much, much older than the land would, you know, than anything else on in upstate New York. It just feels mm, much mm. older. Um, anyway, did, it, was, it did, was profound. Yeah. Did, well, did you, uh, did those of you who were kids there talk about uh, the fact that you were being uh, given acid once a week? Yes. Um and what we did, what, what I came to understand from my friends was that they had a different kind of experience at Millbrook than I had. Um, they had, there were sort of two kinds of groups of parents. One group of parents was very uh, tuned into their kids and their welfare and their well-being and was making sure that they sat down and had three square meals a day and that their clothes were being washed and that they were being attended to. That was my friend Glenn and Cliff and Eric. Their their mothers were of that ilk. My mother was 
of the ilk that let us run wild and do whatever we wanted to do. And she figured when we got hungry, we would find some food. And when we needed, we got cold, we'd find something to wear. That was basically Diane's um, philosophy of child rearing. And uh-huh. I can ask you, do, doesn't it sound uh, apt, given what you know of me and my, my siblings? Oh, yeah. um, we basically, we yeah. basically had to raise ourselves. And so what I, what I got from them was that my experience there was different from their experience there. They didn't have bad acid trips, but they were given measured amounts of acid. I was given unmeasured amounts of acid. Mm. So it, it was different. It mm. was different. And, and as much as, um, you know, and I love my mother dearly, and I, I think she was an amazing woman, an incredible poet, and she's contributed a lot to a lot of people's lives. Mm-hmm. Um, she just wasn't really into being a mother. Oh yeah, which is very yeah, well, interesting. Very interesting had, for somebody who had five kids. I mean, she loved. I'm not saying she didn't love us, but being a traditional mother was not her thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, she had a way of being a mother, and uh, she provided uh, for you all and everybody. Um, and you know, I can look back on how I was being a father to Kelly and Kelly and I are very close. I'm also very close with Clay, my younger one. Uh, and mm-hmm. Kelly just goes, I didn't have a father. I had a friend. Uh, yeah. you know, I, you know, yeah. I, I cringe when I think of stuff, uh, around raising Kelly. I mean, it, but the, the difference, it, the difference, it, David, between really, you and Diane, the difference is that you cringe. Diane never cringed. <laughs> Diane never cringed at any of it. I'm serious. Yeah. I'm deadly serious. I'm, and I'm not, you know, I'm not taking away from your laughter. It's very funny. Yeah. But she didn't. She never yeah. thought twice and she never second guessed herself. Yeah. 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 Well, mm, yeah. And I, um, maybe I sound cold. Maybe I sound kind of hard. I, I don't feel, I don't have any animosity no, toward her. I, I don't have don't. any bitterness about any of this stuff. Yeah. It's just, it's, you know, I just think it's important to put, to call it what it was, you know? Yeah. I think you're, you know, you just see it clearly. Um, yeah. Yeah. You, you, you know, uh, I felt pretty critical about uh, Di- Diane, about a number of things, but some other things I appreciate it. And you know, that whole time, we were, it was like just the whole subculture, the whole hippie, acid, everything subculture. And Zen Center had, you know, a lot of people had come from that into Zen Center, but Zen Center offered yeah. like a different type of culture. But it was, it was, um, you know, th- there was uh, uh, th- th- certain values and things that were sort of shared. So, uh, at Zen Center at that time, in in the in the from the say uh, sixty six to you know mid seventies or something, yeah, mm, maybe yeah. was um, had not found uh, you know was was incredibly uh, tolerant and accepting of everything. Uh, it hadn't. It and, had not yet become Protestant Zen, which is what my yeah. That is it true. Later. <laughs> that is true. That is true. That is true. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, you had your own room at Page Street when you were fourteen. Thirteen. Fourteen. Yep. Right. Yeah. Fourteen. Fourteen years old. And and uh, about the time you turned fifteen, before right. you had the other place. And um, yep. you were going out. I mean, you were you were living like like an older teenager. An you know, you were going out yeah. and and uh, anyway, anyway. <laughs> yeah, I was going out. So, I was partying. I was going out dancing and going to the movies. And you know, we were we had a lot of fun. You and I had a lot of fun with our friends and you know on our own. And I I was definitely. Yeah. 
accepted as a, you know, I was treated as a young adult and I was accepted yeah. by everybody. And it was a wonderful thing for me because Zen Center became my adopted family. You know, yeah. they, you, you guys all became, you guys all took the place, became, you know, an extension of my family. And it right. was a very important family for me. It was my grounding. And because Suzuki Roshi, Suzuki Roshi and Okusan always led me, let me know that that was my home. Yeah. It was very uh, clear to me from them that that was my yeah. home. And so I always felt, and you know, I just always felt that way. I felt like it was yeah, my, but, you know, anyway, that, go ahead. That's true. But, but when I, I'm talking about when you're 14 turning on 15, that's like late 72. Uh, right. And uh, you, you, you had had a lot of experience of like hanging out with people at Zen Center and like we'd all go to the Edinburgh Castle or something. You could go, like I mentioned, you could go and they wouldn't guard you. It was just amazing. Right. Uh, right. <laughs> but you weren't, you weren't, a, you didn't drink a lot of alcohol or anything. You just were, you know, wanted to be with everybody. Yeah. That sort of yeah. thing could only have happened then. That's not, true. Not later. That's absolutely not later. true. No. It, it's like, uh, you know, values were formed and and uh, agreements. Like you said, it became more Protestant, but I think it also became more more rational and adult and and more for yeah. I agree. I agree. Uh, more formal, a little more formal in a in a more yeah, traditional way. Yeah, it, it's gotten it. It's had you know it goes through different periods. It's been in in uh, in the it's it's Zen Center is very very careful to uh, be sensitive to everybody's identity trip. Uh, really? And That's I, good I'm, to know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a bit much for me. Uh, I, I I appreciate it. I I think it's good. I'm glad I don't have. I'm glad I don't have to deal with it. Uh, you know, yeah. living in Indonesia yeah. uh, is just. Very, very different. Um, yeah, I'll bet. And, well, living and, in Montana is uh, kind of different, too. <laughs> <laughs> I bet, yeah. Uh, yeah. But they're doing good. Zinson is doing good. It's a very strong institution. I have good relationships with everybody. Um, I mentioned to and, you that I was there in 2017. I spent a week um, when everybody was away between practice sessions. Um I spent a week at there. Which place? At Zen, at, at Zen Center. Well, Zen Center is the name of the organization. It's got three centers. Oh, no, I spent, I mean, it's I got mean, it's, page, it's got Page three, Street, uh, it's got Green Street. Yoke. I'm yeah. sorry, I meant at 300 Page Street. Yeah. 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 I stayed there for a week, and it was wonderful. It was another one of those, uh, you know, 17. Really? perfect experiences for me. Far out, far out. Yeah, far out. Yeah, I have great relationships with people there. Um, mm, mm. Uh, one thing, going back to your life with Diane and this and that, you, you told that very interesting story about meeting Vince when you were 17 and he turned you on to coke, right? And yeah. you said you yeah. didn't even know what it was. You had been around nope. a lot of coke since uh, at, at Diane's house. And you did well, know what it was. And you, look, I, w I had my first Coke at Diane's house, and you gave it to me. Really? Yeah. Really? 1972. That's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Um, I, guess, I guess I should amend my statement and say that <laughs> while I might have known what it was, I did not have the kind of experience with it that I quickly got to having. Yeah, you weren't a coke because addict. When he turned, Nobody was. When he Nobody turned, was there. When he turned me on to it, what he did was he pulled out an ounce bag uh -huh. and proceeded to start uh -huh. snorting it right out of the bag. So he had a different oh. kind of, you know what I yeah. mean? He had a different approach. And his, yeah. he was into like, you know, it was just as much as possible, as often as possible. And it was, it just wasn't a good scene. It just hey. wasn't a good scene. Oh, it quickly, no, no, it quickly no. deteriorated. Coke's, look, <laughs> Coke's not a good thing in 
in, in small quantities, you know, I mean, it's not the end of the yeah, world, yeah. but, um, well, yeah, I don't right. take, I haven't taken anything. I haven't touched anything in 17 years. So Good including coffee. Good <laughs> uh, so well, I can't, I, have, I can't quite say that. I can't quite say that, but I certainly haven't done cocaine or anything like it since 1987. So I'm doing all right. I'm hanging in. Okay. <laughs> I can't believe I was the first person who gave you coke. That's the funniest thing. Well, it was right there in the kitchen, and in the they, kitchen, it was right on. It was sitting on the table. Yeah, right? Ed had it. Ed had it. Ed, Ed would give. Ed you, had it, of course. Ed would give. Ed always had a little coke on him, and if you wanted coke, mm -hmm. he would give it to you. And Diane didn't care. Uh, yep. And, but there wasn't a, it wasn't a big coke drip. I mean, it, it was a. It, it was wasn't a, a big deal, it was right? A pot it wasn't. Trip. It was a take it or leave it thing for me back then. You know, yeah, it wasn't yeah. something oh, I went I never... after. It wasn't something. Yeah, it wasn't something I sought out or looked for. Yeah, or, no, you no. You know, went and bought or anything like that. Yeah, um, Ed. Ed would roll cigarettes. Uh, yeah. To pot cigarettes. And and splits, had a it looked, right. and had a pack of them where they looked like cigarettes, and he'd keep them in his shirt pocket and pull one out, and would smoke it like it looked like a cigarette. And that was his trip. Also, hash. And it was and, full of coke, and the end of it was full of cocaine, right? The end of the cigarette? Oh, I don't know about that. I don't oh, know yeah, he that. used to do that, too. He used to pack the ends of the, ends of the cigarettes with coke oh, and I, light I, up. I never, and, I never saw that or experienced that. Huh. Oh, okay, uh, okay. I've heard of it. Definitely heard of it. Not supposed to be a good thing to yeah. do. Um, no, it's uh, But once, all right, I want to, I want to tell you a story here. Uh, okay. Green, Green Gulch Farm, uh, we got in 72. And right. it was offered uh, for by George Will Wright for $300,000, which is like, just a nominal amount. It's like, it's a like selling it's like a house a, yeah. for a dollar. Um, yeah, yeah. And um, but Zen Center didn't have three hundred thousand. And and uh, George, uh, his lawyer was another George. Uh, you know, they wanted fifty thousand down. So there was a uh, East Coast investor who I knew because his sister was in Zen Center, and he loaned uh -huh. Zen Center the fifty thousand uh, for that. Nice. And, you know, so I tended to meet and know everybody who came around, right? And, of course, uh, of course. He and I, so I got to know him a little. When he got back to the East Coast, to Boston, he got hold of me and asked me if I could send him some hash. <laughs> so I told you. Uh -huh. I told you. I said, hey, good. And, you know, and then you told Ed this was some hash. For a, for a, a, for a good cause. For a good cause. Well, of course. So yeah. Ed, Ed got a big ball of hash and maybe we made a candle in the, oh, in wow. the Zen Center basement and put the hash <laughs> like wrapped in tinfoil inside the candle and had it all wrapped as a present to him, to mail. And I, I put it in the, I was the work leader in the building. I put it in the Zen Center outgoing mail. And it went into, I think it was a Volkswagen bus, was uh, like the, the Zen Center was shopping with them. And it was stolen. Any no way. Front on that street could get stolen. Uh, oh my God. Uh, the old bus got stolen. I always said anything you put in in San Francisco in view in a car, you're giving away. That's um, absolutely true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anywhere in San Francisco it can happen, but there, my God. Anyway, the whole thing was gone, so we lost it. So we did it again. You got another one we, for me, and we made another candle and put it in and sent it to him. All right. So fast forward to. Uh, uh, Dick Baker and Yvonne Rand are on the East Coast on a fundraising trip, and they're visiting him. Jay is his name. Yeah. And Jay at one point says, oh, hey, 
When you see David Chadwick, thank him so much for sending that hashish. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks a lot, Jay. (laughs) Oh, my uh, gosh. I had to answer to that. But, I don't know, Richard was always very tolerant of me. He was very... How did Yvonne take that? Yvonne, Yvonne too. Huh? That's That's why Yvonne said that. I never could understand why Yvonne, when, well, it doesn't, I, I don't know if we want to talk about this, but anyway. You yeah, know, no, I want. What are you going to say? The, the, the whole say? kerfuffle happened, when the whole thing happened with the, with the lawyers and the, and the, you know, this, the sort of pseudo case that was supposedly being brought against Zen Center for right, my right. mistreatment, supposed, my supposed mistreatment. Um, yeah. Yvonne said she couldn't believe that I didn't remember. See, I didn't remember. What happened to me was my memory went completely blank after Vince. After I, after I left Vince and Vince then died, the trauma, the trauma of the violence of our last year together and the subsequent breakup and his subsequent murder Something about that trauma of that year just did my memory in. Mm-hmm. And I literally don't remember any of this stuff, David. I, mm. I mean, I remember I, some of it comes back to me as you start to tell me some of the pieces. I mean, I can remember being in the, in the, you know, the kitchen and at the house and Page Street and, and Ed. And, you know, I, it's not that I can't remember any of it. I, I don't mean to make it sound like that. But, but for me to independently come up with all these memories would be impossible right now. Huh. So right. I didn't really, I didn't really understand why Yvonne said um, that she didn't believe when I said I didn't, I, I had no memory uh, because the the way that the case was supposed to be brought, the only thing that made it viable was that I had just come, supposedly come to the realization that I had been harmed in any way. Yeah, and the reason that 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 was would be viable is because otherwise there's a statute of limitations that runs out three years after you're harmed, unless you just remembered that harm was done. Then it begins to run. That statute of limitations begins to run from the time you have the memory. Yeah, and I was I was saying to the lawyers, look, you guys, I don't remember any of this. I just remembered what you know. I just realizing what happened. And I'm just realizing how old I was at the time. And, you know, that sounds kind of stupid to somebody else because they say, well, how could you not know what age you were when you were, you know, at Zen Center or whatever? But when somebody takes, uh, when something, let me rephrase that, when something like substantial trauma and, you know, uh, uh, exacerbated by drug abuse um, takes its toll on you, it can literally, I'm here to tell you, wipe your memory clean for a few years. Mm-hmm. So Yvonne's, Yvonne's position was that she would go to court and state under oath that I had not forgotten everything because she had been around me in the years after the supposed harm was done. Um, and that would obviously was true. She had been around me in yeah. the years after. But I didn't remember any of that. I didn't remember any of it, David. That's the only reason we got in that position in the first place, is that my memory was completely wiped. I spoke to the lawyers. Yeah. One of them's on the Supreme Court now. Yeah, I know. I and know I said you. what you were saying. I said one of. The, well, I said what you were saying was true. Well, thank you for that, at least. <laughs> and uh, uh, Darlene Cohen and I said we would have a press conference and support you. Uh, Oh, wow. And Darlene was president of the board. Not saying that any specific uh, accusations were true. Not saying that at all, Uh, because they weren't. But that, uh, you know, we had participated, Zen Center and me and different people, in allowing you to live like an adult when you were 14, 15 years old around there. Um, 
you know, we really didn't feel particularly bad about it, but we said, you know, that's what was happening, and your parents were uh, <laughs> gave you their blessing. So, but the same women who became very strong feminists later uh, didn't object then. It was the times. Yeah, like it's, you, it's like you say, it's, you it's were just... being manipulated by your lawyer. But what's oh, amazing? Completely. Oh, you know, he turned out to be a junkie. Did you? Did I tell you that? I, I knew he was a junkie back then. You did? I didn't. Well, yeah, I, I knew people I who were giving me reports on you and him uh, from that. Oh wow! People around the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic. Uh, oh sure. Yeah, and I just said oh. my position was in centers. There shouldn't be a cover up. Uh, you know. This was all wrong, uh, so just admit it. Uh, I, I didn't. I had. I had trouble believing it was a recovered memory. It, was, it became. It became wrong. It be, David. David. We need to put it in. Wait. We need to put it in context, though. It became wrong only because the mores and the the lens with which we viewed everything changed. Your boy had it. You know, it wasn't wrong at the time. It wasn't wrong at the time. And nothing we did, nothing we did. Well, to me, it was wrong at the time. Nothing we did was wrong at the time. Nothing we did was wrong at the time. <laughs> we had a great time together. We did. Yeah. We yeah. had a great time together. Yeah. And you um, were wonderful with me. You, you helped me become the young woman I became because you didn't deny that part of me. You didn't say you have to stay a child. You allowed me to grow. And I will forever be thankful for that. <laughs> okay, well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> I mean it. Yeah, yeah, and we went all those years. You know, the last thing I heard your lawyer call me up and said, don't talk to Jeannie, don't communicate with her. Uh, he said that Elizabeth to you? Sawyer, no, he talked to you directly? He talked yeah, to you directly? I said, I haven't tried oh. to communicate with her. And Elizabeth Sawyer had been talking to you. And I... And Elizabeth. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. She, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I, yeah. I told we Elizabeth a, told you that I said uh, I didn't think this was the best approach. I said uh, what would be best is if you and I wrote a book. <laughs> so you got all hot you know, into that, and your lawyer uh, nixed it. But it would have been a great. It would have been a great idea. Uh, yeah, yeah, but my wife, Elin, said, if I ever hear you mention that again, I will divorce you. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's what nicks that's what nicks that idea, huh? <laughs> yeah, well, well I, that, uh, yeah. that and my lawyer. Yeah, and um, then you told the me he is, and his wife both OD'd the next year on heroin. Yeah, you know, there's something about karma, man. Instant karma, add water and stir. I don't know what to say about that but they both died the next year both of them both of them that's pretty, yeah wow pretty trippy wow. pretty trippy stuff yeah wow. very sad well very sad i really appreciated your getting hold of me mm, god about five years ago uh yeah and it was amazing um you know because i thought about it and i thought i would think periodically, like every few months, and I would think, uh, you know, yeah, I should be back in touch with Jeannie, you know, she was an important <laughs> person in my path, and, but yeah. I just sort of waited for you, I felt like you should make the first move, and you did, and I couldn't believe the email I got, you asked me for forgiveness, <laughs> I wrote back and I said, what, <laughs> you should forgive well, me. Well, I felt like I, I felt like that whole thing with, <laughs> with Michael Leff and the lawyers was such a horrible thing, and it must have been horrible for you, and that's why I wanted you to forgive me, because, you know, I would have I... never done it had I, had I had all my memory, had I had all my faculties, and had I been well myself, because, you know, I had just gone into... Uh, well, I was battling my own issues with substance abuse at the time, and I hadn't yet come to uh, peace with that. And, uh, yeah, it was just, it was a very difficult, it was difficult. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a difficult uh, transition. I'm so glad that we have each other again, though. Yeah, and you know what you told me then? You told what? me you cried 
<laughs> when you got my response, my email response, you told me you cried for two hours. I did. I did. I yeah. cried a lot. I was really touched, David. You, you know, the healing this, healing this, because I felt, you know, I was torn even in the, at the time, despite the brutal situation that I was in, because I was in a horrible situation with, with David and the hate and the whole situation was just traumatic for me. That's David Smith, founder of the Hate Ashbury Free Clinic, uh, where Jeannie worked for some time as, uh, like, very closely with him. I can't even, I just lost my train of thought completely. I just went out the window. I just thought about the trauma and it hit me in the head. <laughs> I completely oh, lost yeah. my train of thought. Yeah. It happens uh, sometimes. Well, I was saying anyway, you cried. You said you yeah. cried for two hours, and it was just such a relief. And then we started talking, and you were like a transformed person. Uh, and, like, we've had a really good relationship ever since then. I feel like we have a great relationship now. Yeah, we do. It's so good to talk to you, David. It's so good to spend some time with you and just, you know, sort through some of this stuff and talk through it and just, you know, get it out of the way and love each other because that's what it's all about, ultimately. Yeah. And you were so important to me, David. You were such an important part of my chi of my childhood, my young my young adulthood. Um, you know, ever since, I mean, I still remember, I can remember, it's so funny, I can still remember Maggie Cress's wedding at Tassajara. Hey, all right, Maggie Cress's wedding, all right? All right, here, yeah. let me tell you. Daya and I are going to it. We have got to leave, like, after dinner to zoom to the airport for a flight to Texas because they had it, like, right before the Christmas holidays at Tassajara, which was ridiculous and kind of Gary you remember you played you played music through the whole thing remember I mean you played no. music through part of it well some of it is that right well I didn't yeah, bring you a did. guitar you were, but somebody had one or something somebody uh, had they had some other people there anyway go ahead you were talking all right, I interrupted so you. so we meet you on the mountain up top you know we're stopping and looking at the view and you were in another car yeah and you gave me some hash to eat <laughs> And I really don't like eating pot or hash because you can't control the amount. And right. I got way too high. You know, if you're a little oh, bit dear. high, it's all right. It's just another type of right, normal. Right. Uh, right. But if getting too high on on uh, cannabis is uh, can be very disorienting, and it's like. Oh yeah. Uh, it, it's not pleasant, right? It's just like every second you're trying to, you're going, let's see, I'm a human being. I live on a planet. I, you know, uh, oh, this is a table. I, right, right. Right? You're just constantly readjusting to, 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 uh, and it's like just takes my breath away. So the whole time I'm there like that, but, you know, then finally it wears off some. Um, and we drove back may, boy we left at the last second we had to we i think we made it in three and a half hours to the airport from there <laughs> i knew how to drive that road really fast well you know, i know that i learned all that generosity from ed may he was my he was my guru when it came to sharing what you had because ed, he ed and meg said, he, Ed and Ed, May. No, Ed, Ed May. His last his last name was May. M A Y. Oh yeah. Ed yeah. May. Yeah. Uh yeah yeah. And One I of just, the Brotherhood of Light guys that hung out at uh, Diane. Right. Right. And at he your just, place. his attitude yeah. was always that you should share whatever you had, and that more would come if you shared what you had. If you if you were stingy and you kept your dope in your pocket, you wouldn't get any more. <laughs> So I was uh -huh. always giving it away. <laughs> uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. And I uh -huh. think that's where I got that. I hope that you. I hope you didn't hold it against me that you got too high. <laughs> no, I held. I held it against me. I should know better. Uh, I yeah. 
Well, anyway. It was funny. Yeah, yes. those were the days, huh? The younger years, yes. Uh, a lot they of, were. Uh, that was an interesting time, David. It was an interesting time, and we were in the middle of one of the most interesting places on Earth during one of the yeah. most interesting times to be on the planet. You yeah. know? Really, yeah. you were. Yeah. My, Mike Phillips yeah. said, uh, is a very good friend, uh, he said mm -hmm. that the uh, 90s, he said in the 80s and into the 90s, they tried the 60s and early 70s. They, you know, they were putting them on they trial tried. and punishing oh, yeah. Yeah. people. They could yeah. go back and punish people. Like, <clears throat> what was it? I hate that. I really hate that. Like, there's a yeah. guy, there's a Japanese guy who just got fired because in 1998 he made a Holocaust joke. I mean, should there be oh my a God. statute oh of my limitations God. on that? Good Lord. There should be, and, yeah, there should, needs to be a cultural statute of limitations. I mean, things change. People, mores change, morals yeah. change, people change. It's That's crazy. what I tell people. That's what I tell people. I mean, people, man, you know, you just, People, America is so puritanical and people are so self-righteous. Uh, and, you know, I just say, if you've been back there then, chances are, and if you've been living in that some culture, you would have been the same. Yeah. You would have thought the same. Yeah. Almost everybody been, does. Been, Guess how many right. people were uh, were uh, against slavery in, in places that had slaves? Almost nobody. Right. And... You would have been too, or I would have been. But they say about yep. uh, the studies say about ten percent of people make independent moral decisions. About ninety percent <laughs> go along with whatever is happening, including the Holocaust. Uh, yep. And you know, uh, if you want things to happen never again, you can't just be persecuting the past all the time. You've got to be looking at the present. And what we're doing now That's in the right. present is we are destroying the biosphere quickly. Very what, quickly. What we are doing Very makes quickly. the Holocaust <laughs> look like running a red light. We're, really, we're destroying really the entire biosphere. It's true. Uh, and you know, what's, you know what's really amazing about it? It doesn't seem like people are, I, I mean, maybe people do understand it. The planet is going to be fine. One way right. or another, the, the planet <laughs> is going to be fine. We just won't be here to see it. Well, yeah, but but it, it looks like we might take all life with us. Uh, uh, because, there'll but, be enough. There'll be a, there'll be there'll be enough microbes left for something to kick off again, David. Come well, on now. Look, you gotta even be tardigrades. Optimistic. <laughs> even tardigrades. See, tardigrades are the thing that can live in ours. Live every. They. Uh, tardigrades. Are those the things that, they, they, are those they the can't, things that they live can't, in the? Uh, live in the yeah, go ahead. They can't keep living forever in uh, too much heat. Or like, like the 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 song we're going to work on tomorrow is a song I did called "We're on Our Way to Venus." We're turning the planet <laughs> Earth into Venus, which has eight hundred, nine hundred degrees, and it ain't nothing living there because all, uh, that's so much carbon yeah. dioxide in the atmosphere. Now yeah. I hope we turn yeah. it around and don't do that. But there doesn't seem to be all the movement toward, uh, toward, you know, uh, health, health, not doing health, that health. is way overwhelmed right. by the movement toward doing that. But we'll see. I mean, we'll you never see. know what's going to yeah. happen. Uh, no, you never do, and you have to. And I do, I do have some faith in, you know, just the process. I don't know. I don't. I don't feel a sense of complete hopelessness. Oh, I don't really? feel it at all because uh, I think if you just see the big picture, you realize, as Steve Tipton just said in an email, we were talking pretty. We were emailing pretty pessimistic. He said, "Oh well, planets come, planets go." Uh, yeah, that's basically. How we're I'm part of a big the... picture, <laughs> you know. This is uh, look right. at it from a Hindu point of view. Uh, right. The you know, the Kali Yuga, the, you know, Shiva's dancing. Uh, there's, there's, uh, and, you know, this is all very big here in Bali. Brahma is the, the creator. 
uh, Vishnu's the preserver, and Shiva is the destroyer, are the transformer. Destroyer, right. But right, uh, right. we don't end, we just transform. Uh, so uh, we'll right. see what happens. Right. But it's, e e you know, equals MC squared. <laughs> right? it, we should try to preserve it. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible crime. I agree. What no, we're I doing. agree. I'm not. I'm not trying to be flip at all. I think it's terrible what we're doing. You're don't, not. Don't, You're I'm not, not being. Like, <laughs> well, I'm flipping all the time. My God. I mean, you can't. You can't be. You know, serious about that. Nonstop. Well, you know. Uh, well, anyway. that's why I keep saying the the planet will be fine. It might be covered with plastic. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we are, we are producing way too much plastic, but you know, plastic can be destroyed. It just has to be incinerated. Ooh, that creates and dioxin, the, terrible poisons. Yeah, they don't they don't, know, have, um, they don't have they don't have a method to burn. Yeah, uh, but, but there are things that can transform plastic. And uh, I have plastic, a question for you, Chadwick. Yeah. I have a question for you. Do you know anything about the viability of of uh, desalinating water? Well, it's done. It's very expensive, but they're working on uh, new methods to do it. And they'll probably get up, a, a, you know, it gets cheaper as time. There's a tremendous amount of it going on, and a lot of it's being done in, in fresh water. That's getting too salty because of uh, destroying the water tables around the world. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. And... Uh, but there's so much stuff like that. There's something so ironic about this whole issue with water and, and the water shortage and, and our our planet's covered with sea. You know, it's it's just very interesting to me. Yeah, yeah. It's well, fascinating. But we have yeah. we we have definitely done something. We've definitely broken something because uh, I'm sitting here in Montana, and the fires in Oregon are burning. So fiercely that they've blanketed my skies with thick smoke for weeks. There's an article in Washington Post today about what to do about that because the smoke's going everywhere, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, not everywhere, but it's going many, many places. Um, yeah. I'm posting, uh, I've already created a post. I have two, once, I have what's new, uh, 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 cuke what's new blog blogger cuke what's new or whatever uh and then i have the cuke, cuke nonsense blog you can get to them from like cuke dot com. and the nonsense yeah. blog i do personal things and and climate change things and uh stuff about bali and what's going up I'm... tomorrow is a link to an article on the washington post about the wet bulb temperature and that's something that that uh Experts in the field have been using, but it is only now starting to become, uh, as the public starting to become a little bit aware of it, and there'll be more. And that is the the uh, combining humidity and temperature, uh, because if 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 the wet bulb temperature gets uh, above ninety five, uh, human uh -huh. being can't live. Oh. Uh, so the humidity is because we can't we heat. can't we right. keel, we cool ourselves right and if there's yeah. too much heat and humidity at the same time we can't, we cool, can't ourselves. cool ourselves uh, right. and so one has to get to a cooler place or has to be an air conditioning i would think uh uh fans and uh, you know you can air condition with with fans pretty well um, well, we ha we're I'm very lucky. And personally, I have a, a beautiful, I live in a beautiful home. That's I mean, it's not you know I'm not wealthy, but it's a very nice house, and um, uh, I have an air conditioner. We have central air conditioning, and oh, I have a wonderful wonderful air cleaner for my inside air so that I can get the smoke and particles some of the smoke and particles out. So we're actually Jeannie good. personally isn't suffering. No, it's interesting though. We have we've talked about a lot of things, but we haven't talked very much about. Have we talked very much about actually about Zen Center? We've talked a lot about the cultural, all the cultural aspects of living in the times, and 
you know, and, and about us. But I don't know if we've talked about actually, I don't know, not that it matters. Oh, I was just saying, I was just, I was just kind of thinking that we've talked a lot about the times that those were and the cultural, you know, culturally what it was like to live then and there, but we haven't talked that much about actually um, being at ZC. Your description, the thing you wrote, well, you can sure write me anything you want. I think you shouldn't hold back. Uh, uh, your description of your relationship with Suzuki Roshi is wonderful, and uh, Thank you know, you. I you you heard the the podcast. It's like one of the pieces for Tatsuhara stories, right? It's beautiful, David. Thank you so much for including it. Well, I really appreciate that. Yeah, the best part of it was what you wrote that I read about <laughs> your really, and uh, I'm working with uh, Wendy Piercig on him. Um, uh -huh. whose husband did the Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, her late husband. Uh, yes. And, and um, uh, you know, I put the, I've been putting those up for 10 months now, once a week, uh, sometimes like an hour. Uh, recently, they've been short, much shorter, because I've got so much other stuff I'm doing, and it takes time. I have to go over stuff. And uh, But um, she thought... Uh, that stuff uh, about, well, it's called Deprima, that particular piece. It's about Diane coming and the kids and this and that, but especially about you. And she thought that piece, uh, your description of Roshi, she said, I know the book is mainly about students, and that's true, but it's also, Suzuki is throughout it. And she said, I'd like that description earlier. I said, fine, she said, because it really is, uh, gives them a wonderful feeling about it. So anyway, that was great. Yeah. Um, Thank you so much for giving me that feedback. I appreciate it. Yeah. I, I feel like we didn't really talk. You know, I was wondering if we wanted to talk about it at some point, maybe not for this part of it. You want to, or maybe I'm supposed to write it. I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> things like, um, 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 you know what it was like to study with Oakson, to study tea ceremony with Oakson, or sit sit there all those days with. You talked about we it. Talked about it. Yeah, I guess we did. And and we, I mentioned working with, and I mentioned working with Yoshida Roshi, right? No, because that was important no, too. No, you did no? not. I did not. Uh, uh, no, hmm. Yoshida. Missed all right, that. Yoshida is. Uh, we call her Yoshida Roshi. She had uh, studied with uh, Hashimoto, who was uh, one of Katagiri's. Mm -hmm. He was Ka Hashimoto was like Katagiri's Dharma teacher, his second teacher, very famous, respected, okay. revered Zen master. And Yoshida was a woman uh, who had a nunnery mm -hmm. in Japan. She came to mm -hmm. Zen Center to teach the sewing method for sewing the uh, yes. sacred uh, uh, okasa and raksu, which is like a bib. Uh, which is a uh, a miniature okasa, which the okasa goes back to Buddhist robes, is the robe of ordination. Anyway, yes. Yeah, so you study with and the robe, the robe you which you you we would take we would take a large piece of cloth and cut it into many small pieces, which were to represent the rags that the monks used to use back in thousands of years ago right. to make their robes. They used rags and they sewed, the, the rags would be sewed together by villagers or by the monks themselves, I don't know. And so to represent that tradition, we take a piece of cloth now and we cut it into many pieces and we sew it back together, chanting the name of the Buddha with every stitch that we put in the robe. Mm -hmm. And this amazing teacher comes from Japan, not speaking a word of English, and sits with us day in and day out and imparts this amazing teaching just by using her hands, you know, by having, by sitting next to us and showing us with her hands exactly what we're supposed to do. And, and yeah. just with her presence, you know, she was so beautiful, such a powerful presence. I mm. felt really blessed to spend that time with her. Um, and she had, she had people chanting uh, Namukie Butsu with every stitch, right? 
Do you yes. remember that? Right? Yes, yes. That's what I just, yes, I just said that. We chanted the name of the Buddha with every stitch. Right, right. That's I was what saying we it did. was Nam- Namukya Butsu, I think. Yeah. Namukya Butsu. Namukya Butsu, exactly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, that's... Yes, it was, it was a be- such a beautiful, it was, a, it was a many, many months, and I think it was over the summer, David. It was over a summer, I, I want to say. Maybe that's wrong, but anyway, it was many no, months. No, it was over the and... summer. It was over the summer. And you sewed my okesa. You sewed my yeah. okesa for when I got ordained in the fall, and I sewed my rock uh-huh. suit. And I probably had it was... my rock suit too. Uh, <laughs> I was really honored to be able to do that. I really enjoyed doing that. Yeah, I really did. It was it was great. It was a really really great experience for me. Yeah. Well, thank you very much for doing that, God. Yeah. I, yeah, you, sure. I, it's my pleasure. <laughs> uh, I was uh, always happy to get out of whatever sewing I could. But, you <laughs> see, you were into it, so that's good. I was into it. Yeah, it worked out well. It worked, we were a good balance in that regard, yeah. yes. <laughs> I, I sewed my first uh, rock suit uh, the, um, the year before the lay rock suit, the 1970 lay ordination where like 50 of us got lay ordained the first yeah one, i was part of that one first group work ordination what? that had happened since 62 uh mm-hmm. there might have been some individual. and roshi did roshi did all the inscriptions right right he did all the inscriptions he did all of them for the lay ordination you were in on two which was 71 in the summer uh i was okay. 70 in the summer and uh, but he didn't do it for my rock suit for getting ordained. He was too sick, so Katagiri did it. Oh wow, uh huh. Which was fine with me because Katagiri was of course one of our teachers too. Uh, of course, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Well, yeah, I know she was really sick by then. She yeah. Was really sick by then. I remember. Yeah. Well, uh, I remember that. It's true. Our our conversations did tend to gravitate uh, a lot toward um, lower realms. <laughs> <laughs> and But, you know, it's only so much you can say about practice and zazen. Yeah. I mean, zazen yeah. and practice, they basically get down to just doing what you're doing. Just doing it. You just do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Is sit zazen is just sitting, sewing yeah. is just sewing, <laughs> and yeah. you know, there's some idea that's so pervasive that there's some spiritual stuff and spiritual things you do, and there's all this spiritual <laughs> advice and right. sp- inspiring spiritual teachings, but. Really, what it gets something different, and as if it's something other. Yeah, yeah, something different, something higher, something. Yeah, and esoteric teachings. Yeah, the esoteric. To me, the esoteric (laughs) teaching I love is that old famous uh, chop wood, carry water. You know. My favorite. My favorite, also, absolutely. Yeah, I absolutely. But you know, one reason I, I am just not interested in spiritual things mainly i I, i'm sort of superficial is that maybe (laughs) i just i'm not i'm not very profound you know i I, things Mm. get too complicated or too fancy or anything i lose interest i get bored um you know i I can relate (laughs) i can yeah. I'm very, I am become very simple. My life has become very simple. Yeah. You know, it's uh, the, the simpler and more, e- and the, e- e- the easier it is, the more content I am. Yeah. The less drama, the better. <laughs> the less drama. Yeah, boy, ain't that true. That's a nice thing about uh, at being older, mm. and Katrinka and I, Katrinka and I have been together 17 years, and nice. very low on drama. And that that's one of the key yeah. elements. And 
you know, what reminds me of is uh, Suzuki saying, uh, he would say things like the reason we practice is or the purpose of practice or the most important thing for hundreds mm -hmm. and then follow it with hundreds of different responses. I've got most important, I've got <laughs> like, I've got in his lectures, I've got the phrase most important. Uh, it was either most important thing or most important point. And there's like, you know, 170 of each of them or something. <laughs> uh, but anyway, one of them that I really love is uh, uh, the, uh, the reason we practice is so that we can enjoy our old age. And I oh. really experienced that. Uh, yeah. Life is so yeah. much easier going. I mean, it's still difficult. It's always difficult for everybody. <clears throat> But it's like much smoother sailing now. And it's the, the God, low isn't it, drama. Isn't it though? <laughs> I'm not so grateful for that. Yeah, not fighting. He used to tell me, don't fight. You got to be patient. You, you have to develop patience. Um, yeah. And there's always the, the undercurrent of the things that you're uh, trying to get to rise above so to speak but they they become smaller and smaller in a bigger arena and yeah. con control that's, a, that's a good way to put it uh yeah that's an interesting way to put it that the, that the arena gets bigger yeah yeah and everything else is relative you know relative to that takes its place yeah the arena does get bigger uh -huh, yeah oh hey all right so one thing in in the thing, well, I I included in the 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 podcast about Diane. I included the poem she wrote for you. Uh, nice. Where you'll be mating with monks in caves. <laughs> <laughs> it's for eternity. Yeah, right? and let's remember in she dedicated. Right? Yeah, she dedicated Diary of a Beatnik to you. Do you remember that? I did not remember that. Yeah, Diary of Beatney. You open it up for Jeannie. The whole book is the whole book is de is dedicated to me. Oh, for oh, Jeannie, wow. and then she goes on to talk about as she said to me once, I had sex with everything that wore pants from the age of fifteen uh, that I wanted to, and none of them ever controlled me, and I never had a baby except when I wanted one. That's what she said to My me. My mother said that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, she was a strong woman. <laughs> she was a strong woman. Yeah, she was. Yeah, she was she sort really of Spartan. You know, like they throw the kids, they put yeah, the kids out that's of babies. Interesting. <laughs> See if they live. Interesting <laughs> word. I like that word. Yes. That's a very good, David. Yeah. That's a very well. That's a great. That's a. That's a great characterization of Diane. Yeah, and and that's she. That's brilliant, actually. <laughs> she. Uh, did not she had no regard for uh community standards or law or anything that she didn't agree with any convention any convention no she had no regard for convention of any sort like in fact bring it on <laughs> she flaunted it yeah i was talking about the diggers and that thing on her uh you know some of the you know i've I was raised on respecting property and other people's stuff. And I saw diggers mm -hmm. do it. Now, it would be a, it's not a, a bra, I'm not condemning the mm -hmm. diggers, but I saw individual acts by diggers, which I did not yeah. like. Like, uh, I knew a digger who worked for the post office and was stealing Christmas presents and giving them to yeah, that's poor totally uncool. hippie that's kids. Totally, yeah. Right? And yeah, then that's totally messed up. Another one bragged about uh, he always got his Christmas tree by finding some fat capitalist yard to take it from. Uh, anyway, that sort of thing I didn't like. Yeah, they got a little. They got a little arrogant. I think yeah. they got a little arrogant. You know. No, I was just going. But I mean, I think I think they did some good things. I think giving away free food was good, and I think some of the things they did were completely out of line. Yeah. So, you know, I I'm I can see both sides of this. Yeah, um, I I love the diggers. That story. 
I loved the diggers. I went and mm-hmm. ate digger food. I'd get in line and get the free food. They had a free store. <laughs> they ate. What a concept. <laughs> and really? They did, you know, it's experimental. And so yes. some things don't work so well and are some things, you know, uh, no. But, you know, there was something amazing about the way that people, people threw themselves into these activities. Mm-hmm. You know, community was, at least in San Francisco, there was a sense of community on a, on a grander scale, I think, on a, on, you know, than just uh, a, a, the way we think of a house or a commune or a, a group of friends. There was this sort of sense of community throughout the hate and throughout the lower hate. And into the mission, you know, into these different neighborhoods, there was a sense. And in that community, people were were into helping each other. They were into trying to feed each other and taking care of each other's kids. And, yeah. you know, handing out free clothes and, you know, playing music for each other and, you know, doing things that brought people together. And that was very much a, a factor of the. That was very much a part of the times. And there were those who would accept anybody into that and there were those who uh, were uh, more discriminating and would not want someone who yeah. they, they thought was too square or too straight. Right. Or, uh, right. And there were all these people that were on power trips, like guru trips. They were, you know. Right. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. There were a lot of crazy. Well, Charles Manson was one of them. He was in the hate. Uh, yeah. Wow. Was he really? Yeah, yeah. He, he oh, lived in the hate I'm for a while. Glad I missed that. I met dudes like that, you know, that seemed a little dangerous. Well, I remember once, I remember in one house that we were in, uh, Eldridge Cleaver was hanging out. Wow. And I remember one day walking into the living room, David. This is no shit. It was a three, I think it was 347 Belvedere or 327. I don't know. I could have been. Doesn't Either matter, doesn't matter, keep going. Anyway, um, Eldridge Cleaver was sitting in the living room, and he had some armaments next to him, and there was another guy in a chair, and I was supposed to be able to watch television that day, and I know exactly what I was supposed to be allowed to watch. I was supposed to watch the Miss Universe pageant, and I had been given permission to come into that living room and watch television on that TV, and I really wanted to do it. And so I went in and I sat down in the living room with these guys and they were having, they were doing a gun deal. They were doing what? Doing what? They were, they were doing a gun deal. They were arranging for the sale of the guns. I'm sorry. I don't understand. I don't understand you. They They ignored me. I'm sorry. Maybe I'm not being clear. So we were in a house on, we lived in this house on Belvedere street. Yeah. Diane lived there with, with, Peter Coyote was staying in the house, a few other people. Anyway, one day I came downstairs and Eldridge Cleaver was in the living room. Yeah, I hear all that. But what was next to him? And he had a bunch, he had guns. Oh, guns, guns. Guns, yeah, guns. All right. And he was, and he had another, there was another man I didn't recognize. And they were having a discussion and I was supposed to be taking possession of the living room i was uh, like 11 years old yeah or 10 yeah it was supposed to be my living room that afternoon so i just sort of walked in and you know i was uh trying to claim my space and they just ignored me and continued with their business and and proceeded to do their gun deal right in front of me do their what just an do their what do they did this deal for the guns, David? Oh, they did a duel. Clear. Are you saying a duel? They did a, de- a deal. No, a deal. Oh, a deal. Money. They exchanged for the oh, guns. Oh, they yes. were doing a deal for guns. Oh, all right. That's what yeah, I didn't yeah, understand. Yeah, 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 yeah. Huh? I'm sorry. I, I something that my well, story didn't come through. That's very rude of it them. Did you get bizarre. to watch the Miss Universe pageant? Not uh, not in that house. I did eventually get to watch it. I had to leave the house and go somewhere else and watch it, though. <laughs> well, that's very <sighs> rude of them. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> that's. It was that, just that, kind of, but that was, but that's another weird, you know, one of those little weird asides of the, a little sign of the times, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for talking about Yoshida, and yeah. us, us trying yeah. to talk about. Zen and Zen practice. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, okay. 
I'm sure those conversations have come up and, and are good with the right people. Yeah. Yeah. But it was a good conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we've covered some good ground here. We're, we're, um, uh, old with, buddies. We're old. Uh, we are. And because of, and, and it's very clear to me that we're, you know, multi lifetime buddies. So, you know, all right. I'm sure we said it to each other before. Well, of course, of course. Right. That makes sense. I, right. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't really believe in anything. I like, I like roll things around as, uh, look you at know, it this way, look at it this I'm way. No, to... let's look at it this way now. <laughs> I think that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful doctrine in and of itself. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I really think, uh, uh, belief is, uh, we need belief. Well, it's like, you know, you need things in balance. Belief, if belief yes. gets too strong, it it um, it it crushes us. It crushes our yes. spirit. Uh, yes. So strong faith is not believing and clinging to things. It's having trust yeah. and yeah. confidence yeah. in absolutely. Like like Einstein said, he said that the question we have to resolve for ourselves is. Is the universe friendly or not? Is it my friend or not? Or, right? Can I trust it? Yeah. So faith yeah. is having that sort of trust. Um, yeah. But it's not holding on to a belief and, you know, that some action figure has uh, created the universe or something. Exactly. Uh, exactly. I'm with you there. I'm with you there, babe. Yeah. All right. Listen, huh. onward and upward. Yeah. It's yeah. always lovely. Always lovely to talk to you, David. Always lovely. Yeah, yeah. It's good. It's good. And, you know, the past, in some ways, as what I found is as things get back in the past and the people I was around who I can communicate to about that die, it yeah. stops having any importance. And sort of dissolves and it's the same as if it never happened that's very and, interesting yeah uh the, the, but you don't we, feel that way about suzuki roshi's death well um no we, we will forget that i mean these are everything's temporary it's a temporary expression yeah. Yeah. of yeah. Yeah. of something that's evolving and and yeah. it's like holding on to forms and words. Yeah, some some forms and historical events and experiences are very important and last longer, but it all disappears. It all disappears. It does. And, and it does. that's not bad. That's good. That's because we are, our essence is, is pure and not uh, dependent on any form or memory hmm. or anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. but um, anyway, I still cling desperately to uh, so do all, I. My, all the <laughs> truths and memories and everything. But they're they're disappearing. They're all. But, but to me, we all we're always together. Yeah. We just we don't we yes. don't understand. You know, we're sort of trapped in this smaller. world. I mean, we get out of it. We expand beyond it, but. Basically, we're human beings, and we don't know what's happening. And uh, but we have trust, <laughs> we have faith, and we we muddle we muddle through as best we can. That's right. It's been very uh, wonderful speaking with you. Uh, it's and, been a delight uh, speaking with you, my dear. Yep, love you a lot, okay. David. Take care. Yeah, bye -bye. you too. Take care. Bye bye. Have a good night. Take care. Yeah, same to you. All right. I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot, Jeannie DePrima, for sharing all that with us. Very honest. Very open. Until next time, this is DC Puba of Geek Audio and Geek Archives coming to you from Sleepy Sonora with Dog at Bandita, Feline Cuchita, and dear lovely Katrinka, wishing you and yours and all of us 
a grand awakening.